the work is still required labor. doesn't always remain constant. A driver's vision is often limited to the few cars immediately ahead. When one driver changes speed for even a moment, the balance the situation quickly gets out of control. Sound check. Let's Sound put check. ourselves in George's shoes. Pretend you're behind the wheel. Your imaginary brake pedal is a few inches to the left of your right foot. When you see the stoplight, push down on the brake pedal. The clock will start when the red light flashes. A full sweep is one second. Check your reaction time when you hit the brake. Now let's move the light back to the point where George first saw it, at only 28 feet. Remember, lift your foot from the imaginary accelerator and stamp on the brake pedal. Take your cue from the light. Ready? Let's try it. Because you were expecting it, you probably did pretty well. But an emergency with its distractions would probably be something else. Let's try it again. Average reaction time under emergency conditions is three quarters of a second. Three quarters of a second may not seem very long, and it isn't. But when you're traveling at 50 miles an hour, three quarters of a second translated into reaction distance is 55 critical feet of roadway. We're not going to elaborate on the additional 188 feet of braking distance. We'll assume both vehicles stop equally well. Let's see what happened to George. He was following the truck at only 28 feet although they were both doing 50 miles per hour. When the truck driver hit the brakes, George reacted one half second later. Which was better than average, but it still cost him 36 valuable feet. The distance lost in reacting forced George well beyond the point of no return. George Dockstoner, a motion picture stunt driver, and his partner, Jerry, are going to drive these two cars at 50 miles an hour. To make certain that we control number two's following distance, a rope between the cars is measured out at 60 feet. If the rope remains taut between the cars, George, in number two, will be tailgating, with five feet to spare when Jerry, in number one, slams on his brakes. Remember, three quarters of a second reaction time, 55 feet of reaction distance. We're allowing 60 feet. All set? Let's go. Supplemental braking lights on number one car will leave no doubt in George's mind or yours as to his cue to react. We're up to speed. 50 miles an hour.
final stopping distance between the two cars is five feet. We started with 60. The difference, 55 feet, was used by George in reacting to the situation. We'll try it once more. Only this time, we're going to shortchange George. Our 60-foot rope is cut to 50. From a normal reaction distance of 55 feet, we're going to chop off five feet. The drivers are ready. They're off. Quickly up to speed. The tail lights flash. Tailgating at any speed does not make sense, even for an expert driver. George and his partner are okay. The cars are not. You can't drive one automobile three feet into another and expect them to be the same. Experts recommend that you leave one car length between you and the car in front for each 10 miles of speed you're traveling. Four lengths at 40 miles an hour, five lengths at 50, and so on. The additional margin of safety over and above your reaction distance will enable you to be ready for any emergency. You'll be surprised how quickly you relax. And being less tense, you'll be amazed at how much more enjoyable driving can be. Oops, <laughs> it ended early. I was setting it up uh, on Facebook and putting links everywhere, making sure it would look good on uh, um, YouTube, and <laughs> then it quickly ended. Uh, that is the thing about a lot of these films is that you know we're watching them, we're not prepping them, we're not doing what we should be doing, uh, you know, archivally, you know, or even. If you're doing a real presentation, you should be uh, um, prepping them, or at least watching them to make sure that there's enough, they just don't abruptly end. But that's not what we do here for these uh, these screen, streaming events. We just kind of do it on the fly and see what happens. And so, yeah, we get caught by surprise. I need to check the levels here. I think they're a little hot. I don't know if you can see, it's kind of... Yeah, you can't really see, but here there's I can see there's a waveform and it tells me that the levels are a little too high. Bring it down just a smidge. Anyways, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, especially considering what I did to you guys last time. We did a kind of a grab bag and we pulled a bunch of films that I had not seen and we showed this cr crazy, crazy uh, Russian propaganda film about U.S. Uh, and it was all in Russian, and it was a little crazy. Uh, it was awesome. I'm happy that you were there to watch it. Um, there was insane stuff in there, so I'm happy that we showed it. But I also was so bewildered by what was happening, and also I was having technical problems, uh, which have been fixed thanks to a HDMI cable. Thanks, guys. Um, on Patreon for uh, your donations help pay for uh, a decent um, longer HDMI cable. So, uh, anyways, that's all been fixed, and so hopefully we will have addressed the uh, dropouts that we were getting. So, um, at the end of that last stream streaming event that we did, I was so overwhelmed with the insanity of the Russian film and the technology that 
I didn't look at a calendar. I didn't look at. I didn't really kind of come up with an idea of like what we were going to be showing. Um, so I was like, oh yeah, um, I love dipping into uh, a certain collection, and it's a collection that we haven't. We've looked at sometimes, but not all the times. And I love kind of going into it because it has a lot of stuff that got me interested in collecting to begin with, and that is the uh, Texas Department of Public Safety. When I first got started collecting, I got a big batch from the uh, North Carolina Department of Human Resources. And so there were a lot of safety films in there. There were a lot of health films, hygiene films, VD films, driving films. There was a wide variety of drugs, alcohol, great batch of stuff. Um, and so this Texas Department of Public Safety, which I got thanks to uh, uh, Tammy, the Texas Archive of the Moving Image, they went through and pulled out all the Texas-related stuff uh, and they were like, we don't want the rest of this because we don't have the space. So they gave it to me. It sat in um, Austin, Texas, in a basement of Tim League, the owner of the Alamo Draft House. Thank you for that. For about a year or two. And uh, it took going to a, uh, an EMEA conference in Austin for me to go there and actually uh, box up the, the boxes and uh, make arrangements for them to be picked up and delivered to Raleigh and so that's what happens when you get a collection is they sit somewhere for a while then they sit somewhere else and then you get to get into them and and get to check out all the cool stuff so uh, that's what we're doing today there's lots of cool stuff and I'm excited to show it to you um, and it's kind of a grab bag again uh, even though it's from a very specific collection but what I'm gonna try to do is make it more kid-friendly at the beginning, and then go more adult at the end, because this kind of runs the gambit. Um, so, that last film was, um, uh, this film says police only. We'll keep that till the end, <laughs> later. Um, yeah, here we go, this is a good one. Um, yeah, some of these films are made for or police training films, and those are some of my favorite genre because they are so gritty, intentionally gritty. They're trying to acclimatize police officers to what they're going to encounter. So there's lots of cursing, there's fake blood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this one seems to be not so bad. It's defensive uh, bike riding. Yeah, and uh, again, I have not previewed any of these. Uh, some of them I've seen others in the series, so I have a rough idea what we're going to see. Um, we have a pack problem here. All right, we'll see what happens. All right, so here we go. Enjoy defensive bike riding. Did I leave the speaker on during uh, the rewind? If I did, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Bike riding is really coming back into its own as a national sport, fun for a whole family. Great way to exercise, but for many of us there's been a certain amount of hassle, having to use your car to get your bikes to a location where you can ride safely. Now there's a new approach to it though, a way of riding a bike safely in traffic situations. Just as we've learned defensive driving is advocated by the National Safety Council, now the council has developed a set of techniques for defensive bike riding. That's right. You see, Art and I are relatively new bike riders. Hadn't been on bikes since we were kids. Oh, 
but now we can't wait for weekends like this one to get on our bikes and take off. To go on a ride in the park or at the beach. You know, Art's considering riding his bike to work. But up till now, driving through traffic was pretty dangerous for us, and we would never have been on our way if we hadn't heard from some of our young friends in the neighborhood that the National Safety Council was putting on a big show at the Anaheim Convention Center. Since we're always anxious to pick up a few pointers, we figured, what did we have to lose? The Greater Los Angeles chapter of the National Safety Council welcomes you this afternoon. We're filming and making a movie on how to ride a bicycle safely in the street. We're calling it the Defensive Rider's Bicycle Clinic. Could I give you a definition of defensive driving? Defensive driving is driving so as to prevent accidents in spite of the incorrect actions of others and adverse conditions. I was surprised to see the editor of the Air Force magazine there. Who knows, maybe I'd learn more than I thought. When people hear that I'm the editor of an Air Force monthly magazine that deals with automobiles and cycles, they are often surprised. Because civilians think of Air Force people in connection with airplanes, helicopters, and missiles. They're right, of course. Those things are our business. But we found out a long time ago that a lot more of our people are killed and injured in off-duty accidents involving cars and motorcycles and bicycles than in our aircraft. Something had to be done about it. And so this magazine of which I am editor was born. Month after month, we try to get our readers to really think about how they operate and maintain their private motor vehicles. And we think cars and motorcycles and bikes should be fun. What we do stress is a mature attitude. If I can impress with you just one fact today, it is this. Never think of a bicycle as some kind of a juvenile toy. Think of it for what it is. It's a vehicle which must be operated on, on the street with the same caution, good sense, and courtesy that is required to operate any other vehicle. They did a lot more than merely teach them the laws. They explained why they ought to be defensive riders. The law requires that you ride as near as possible the right-hand curb or, or the edge of the roadway. Now, that's fine for the law. While the law protects you after the accident, it doesn't prevent the accident from happening. That's up to you. You see what happens? When you're on a bike, you have an advantage. There are no blind spots like in a car. But at the same time, you can see all the cars around you, and that can be frightening. Many of the young people, like my friend Julie, don't know what it's like to be a driver. So they tried as best they could to get them to see and understand things from the driver's point of view. They showed us the dangers in cars coming from everywhere and what to do to protect yourself. The motorist is looking for another car, coming at him, around him, or beside him. He's not looking for a small object such as a bicycle. A very difficult thing for him to see. And if you're not thinking of ways to react, you can have a very serious injury. It's even more difficult at night. So some states are passing laws calling for bicycles to have reflectors in the spokes on the front and back wheels or reflecting sidewalls on tires, besides head and tail lights. The vehicle in front of you, if that vehicle stops quickly, or if you're following too closely, a collision could occur. And you don't want to rely on signaling from a vehicle. Another thing that impressed me, well, I work with youngsters. They didn't try to scare them with a lot of blood and gore. Instead, they used people in boxes for cars, so nobody really got hurt. The vehicle behind you, that vehicle either fails to stop or he passes you with insufficient clearance, and this is what occurs. Another factor to consider is that if you have a vehicle behind that's following you, and you're going to slow down or turn, tell the car, show the car what you're going to do. Use a signal. 
Another common problem is the problem of a car making a left turn into a driveway to get to their home. And that could happen to We want to be good bicycle riders, safe bicycle riders. We must be defensive bicycle riders. It left a deep impression on me. On me too. Even on my young friend Mario, already a very good rider. I could see him reviewing things in his mind. Now there are six elements we must remember if we want to be a defensive rider. If you have knowledge, checking himself out on the signs. If you are alert. Keeping a weathered eye out for the cars coming up behind him. If you have and use your foresight. Watching out for things that could happen suddenly, unexpectedly. If you have and use your good judgment. Keeping a little extra distance behind the car in front of him and your good skills, you will have a good attitude. And that's what it takes to be a defensive rider. He was determined to be a defensive rider. And they had a simple way to make the idea easy to remember. First, recognize the hazard. Second, understand the defense. And then, of course, act in time. And you know, it really works. Edie and I ran into a lot of things they talked about at the show. For instance, who'd ever think there'd be a hazard at this quiet suburban intersection? But there you are. A car or a truck could run a stop sign just like that. And unless you're on the defense and make sure all the traffic is clear before you cross, you could have an accident. Actually, every intersection is a potential hazard, even if it's only a pedestrian who ignores a stoplight. Again, if you're on the defense, even though the light is green for you, you'll slow down and be prepared to stop just in case. And when you start getting into traffic, well, what would you say is the hazard in a situation like this? Obviously, the vehicle in front of you could stop suddenly, as they demonstrated in the show. Keep a safe distance behind the car in front of you. But what's a safe distance? Like the man said. With a vehicle ahead, we must leave one vehicle length between you and the truck or the car or the bicycle or motorcycle ahead if you're going 10 miles an hour. If you're going 20 miles an hour, you must leave two vehicle lengths. If you're going 30 miles an hour, three vehicle lengths. Of course, if you're on the defensive, you'll give yourself some extra distance to act in time. You'll look more than one car ahead. The heavier the traffic you get into, the more hazards. So the stronger the defense you need. For example, if you want to make a left turn in heavy traffic, what's a strong defense? Play it very safe. Cross over on the right side of the street. Then before you turn left and go through the really heavy traffic, you can always make like a pedestrian. Get off your bike and walk across. And don't worry about your ego, believe me. We really enjoyed the show. But more than that, we now have an approach to bike riding. That makes a lot of sense. Gives you a real feeling of security to know that if you ride defensively, that no matter what someone else may do, you can take care of yourself. Your safety is in your own hands. Like the 
captain said. We think bicycling should be fun. special going places on a bike because we find as much fun in the going as the getting there. That was uh, Sid Davis. That's probably the tamest Sid Davis I've ever seen. Um, really, uh, <laughs> just I only I would have said I would not have known if it was a Sid Davis except that he was in the credits. And so, um, you know, we all know Sid what he's good for, which is the uh, over the top melodrama, melodrama, um, kids getting hurt really badly. Um, let me turn off this and restart rewinding. Um, so we have some visitors here at the archive. Um, okay. um, Viv, would you like to come here and introduce yourself? No? Now she's shy. <laughs> right here. Right here. Look. This is uh, Vivian Shannon, who is the daughter of, of Ian Shannon, um, who are neighbors of mine. Um, not here at the archive, but actually uh, where my wife and I ended up in Raleigh. And uh, Ian was one of the people that was first responsible for uh, me getting into this sad, sad hobby. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, he was the guy, one of the guys who got 500 films for $50 that kind of did damage to my brain one weekend and made me realize that uh, this was something that I wanted to do. So, thanks. Sure, um, anytime. <laughs> Let me get you started on something new. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> what? Look. Right, look, just look, there's the camera right here. Oh. So Vivian is, uh, is the next generation that we're trying to instill the idea of how great these movies are. Uh, but really what she's interested in is having her own YouTube channel. And video games. <laughs> <laughs> on video games. So. She was very excited to see that I am showing this on Twitch. Um, <laughs> the one person who's watching us on Twitch right now, thank you. Uh, but I figured it's way. Watch awake. Ninja on Fortnite. <laughs> 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 All right, thanks for that ad. <laughs> thanks for that ad. Yeah, I should do. You know, Epic Games is based in Cary, uh, so yeah. I should maybe figure out some way to go over there and do something and get millions of people watching it. Um, well, maybe Vivian it. will do a thing about games, and then okay. we will figure out some way to, to do something. That'll be in the future. Not today. I'm not is it live? It. Yes, it is live. Oh. All right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to throw out the next film. Long. Vivian picked the, not this film, but the film after this one, and we'll talk about that one. But this one... Uh, one of the things I like is <laughs> um, one of the things that I like from the Texas Department of Public Safety is there's civil defense films in there. And so um, this is a civil defense film. I'm so sorry if I'm not looking at you guys. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I'm not sure. I'm just slightly just looking. I, I'm not used to being on camera. The light. You're a natural. Okay. Uh, I I didn't know. I I didn't know if you're supposed to look at the big black dot. I did not give you a, a cue. So. Okay. All right. So let's get up. Um and. All right. So um, next film is called Planning. Uh, Planning for Emergence from a Public Shelter. Type this in. 
And it's all about what happens after you've been in a shelter for two weeks. Now, how are you going to get out? So, enjoy. stages of the shelter stay, there is no way to predict definitely the best time to leave the shelter. Emergence depends upon several variable factors. Primary consideration must be given to the existing conditions inside and outside the shelter. Radiation levels inside the shelter will play a large role in determining the length of shelter stay. Other important factors to consider are overcrowding of the shelter occupants. Availability of adequate food and water for the shelter occupants. Sufficient medical supplies for the shelter stay. Presence of illness and disease. And of course, high temperature and humidity readings would be significant. Shelter emergence will depend on all of these in-shelter factors. In addition, any management decision to emerge from the shelter must be based on the following conditions outside the shelter. Radiation levels outside the shelter and radioactive contamination. Availability of safe food and water. Availability of safe and adequate lodging facilities. Availability of general utilities. All of these outside conditions, coupled with those inside the shelter, will determine how soon the shelter occupants may leave the shelter. When radiation levels are low enough, monitoring teams can be sent from the shelter to the outside to gather radiation data. When radiation levels will permit, special mission teams can make short trips outside the shelter to replenish food, water, medical supplies, and other items which will make the shelter stay more comfortable. The success of these special missions will depend on adequate planning. Pete, how'd you like to change the scenery? Can't say that mine. What's up? Well, from all reports, it looks like it's safe to take a trip down the outside corridor. I discussed this with Control Center. The RADEF officer says you're not to exceed five Redkins. How far do you want us to go? Well, I want you and Jimmy to go down that hall to the first left turn, and then as far as the elevator. And I mean just that. As far as the elevator, and no farther. Whatever you say. But there's a Jim Dandy cafeteria right upstairs with loads of goodies. Sardines, soup, canned As and far as the elevator. Understand. Well, is that it? That's it. You and Jimmy shove off as soon as you're ready. Right. Come on, Jim. We got a big hike ahead of us. This is the first stage of emergence. Just down the hall, turn left, as far as the elevator. It may not seem like much, but it is a big step. If the RADEF monitoring team's first probe into the area outside the shelter shows that the radiation level is low enough, the manager may deem it advisable to send out a party to secure needed supplies. Nice low reading, all the way, right up to the elevator. Good, good. I talked to Control Center this afternoon. I got permission to get some supplies from the cafeteria. Well, that's good news. A little diet change would be pretty welcome. When do we go? Well, first of all, you don't. And neither do you, Jim. But Pete and I know the layout of the cafeteria. We should. We've been eating there for about two years. Well, I know, but you had some extra exposure last night. And I want to rotate as often as I can. Harry, you're going to be leader tomorrow. I want you to get five volunteers. Jimmy and Pete, you can brief them on the location of the supplies. Oh, yes, Pete, I need a monitor. Chick Farmer. Good. Now, Harry, I want you to tell everybody to keep an accurate list of everything they get. Uh, Susie, where's that? It's right here. Mr. Uh, 
Amber took Pat Wilson off the list. He was running a temperature this morning at sick call. Nothing serious, but he felt a little goofy. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. She's right, of course. This is just a list of my suggestions, Harry. Uh, Chick Farmer's asleep. You can brief him in the morning. Well, we'll check with Chick first, then get him squared away. Right, Jimmy? Right. Now, Harry, I know getting the groceries is very important. But if you find that the levels are higher than we anticipate, I want you to come back and fast. Okay. Listen, as long as Wilson is under the weather, do you mind if I take Phil Keating? I think you do him a lot of good. Oh, fine with me. It's your party. I got you set to go at 10.30. That'll get you back here in time so we can monitor the supplies and have a new menu ready for lunchtime. Okay, I guess that's it. Has anybody got anything to ask? I do. No, go ahead, Sidney. Well, I know it's no news that it's pretty warm in here, and a lot of people have been getting headaches. Nothing drastic, but the aspirin supply is getting a little low. Well, I'm afraid there's nothing we can do about that right now, Susie. There is a drugstore here in the area, and that's going to be one of my first missions on the outside, but not quite yet. Well, anything else? Okay, that's it. Let's get some sleep. Emergence, and its control are the duties of the shelter manager. As radiation decreases, each trip can become longer and farther afield, but it must be a gradual process. New supplies of food and medicine are not only important to physical needs, they provide a valuable morale booster. However, an emergence that is too early or too long could be dangerous. As reports are received from control center, the manager must evaluate the conditions outside his shelter in respect to the needs of the occupants within the shelter. Each mission must be planned with detailed, greatest care. Well, Harry, I guess congratulations are in order. That was a big success yesterday. <laughs> Susie, did you see those kids tear into those sardines? I did pretty well myself. <laughs> now, you say the levels were low. Yeah, even better than we expected. We would have been okay for almost twice the time. Well, I'd rather err on the safe side. Well, now, tomorrow's going to be the big day. Susie, you're going to get those medical supplies that you are needing. I've gotten an okay to send a mission out to that drugstore on Pine Street. Now, Harry, you'll be the leader. Well, Pete, I'll need another monitor. How about you, Jim? Fine. Good. Our control center says that your mission dose tomorrow is 10 Renkins. I got you set to go at 9.30. Fine. Who else is going? Well, that's up to you. But any volunteers that you get, be sure that they're people who haven't been outside. I want to rotate as much as possible. Exposure? Well, that is important, but I want to give everybody a turn of getting outside. We'll be sure that you give Susie a list of those you pick. We'll do. What about our route? Anything special? Oh, yes, yes, one thing. Now, here we are, and up here is the drugstore. Now, the obvious way to go would be 3rd Street, then up here through Pine to the drugstore. But the control center advises me that this area in here is hotter than the rest of the vicinity. So what we do is cut from here, over to Princess Avenue, up Princess, across Blake, then down Pine Street to the side entrance of the drugstore. It'll take a few minutes longer, but I want to play it safe. Right. What supplies do we get? Jim, let's make sure their clothes are OK. Tide cuffs, something to cover their heads, gloves. Right. Well, you can check with Mrs. Lambert tomorrow about the medical supplies she'll be needing. Go and get some soap. And uh, bring back a load of those paperback books. You'll find them right inside as you go in. Oh, yes, Harry. Do you see any toys or anything the kids might like? I'll bring them along with you. Now, next week, I'm going to talk to Control Center about sending you over to that hardware store, aren't you? As radiation levels drop to a safe limit, the manager will rotate groups from the main shelter to other areas of the building with less protection. For example, people in a shelter with a protection factor of 150 can be rotated into outer rooms having protection factors of, say, 30, 40, 20. Later on, occupants will be permitted to leave the building on a rotational basis. As dependency on the shelter lessens, the need to reestablish the community increases. Homes and places of business may need repair. General utilities may not be operating. As soon as it is advisable, shelter occupants can return to their homes for increasing periods of time and begin the work that will eventually return their community to a normal condition.
Okay, um, you know, it's funny, everybody has commented how calm everybody is in this uh, film. You know, here they are. Um, here they are in this uh, fallout shelter for, I don't know, two weeks, waiting for all the fallout to dissipate. Um, a lot of these films are basically, uh, they are just meetings. So the one thing that survives an atomic blast is bureaucracy and meetings. Uh, and there's like endless board meetings. There's even a film on how to present data at a meeting, you know, post uh, atomic war. Um, it is, it's, it's really fascinating to see how they thought things out and they kind of, I guess they got a bunch of paper pushers to do a lot of these civil defense films. And it's like, oh, well, did you fill out this requisition form? And <coughs> you need to present for this. And you're going to do these samplings, and you need to have a graph that shows this and displays it to people and all this stuff. So here's uh, Vivian again. Hi. <laughs> Who is enamored with the idea that we are going to do some sort of video game thing. Maybe in the future we will do a video game show. I have at least one film that I know of that has video games. Um, it's pretty good. I have to think of if there's at least a couple more. Um, and then maybe we'll bust out the Atari. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> Atari 2600. Uh, Vivian, what was this film that you wanted to show? This one? Was it uh, Trouble Ahead Big Trouble Hunt or just another film? Okay, alright. So we have Vivian, uh, who's here. Um, who's kicking the. <laughs> I didn't mean to! I'm not good at She picked uh, Trouble Ahead, Trouble Behind as the next film we're showing for the National uh, Safety Council. So, Vivian, why did you pick this film? Because it sounds good and it sounds very interesting because I don't like trouble. Because you don't want trouble. It's not because. I don't it, it, like it, trouble. It was a Grateful Dead lyric. Because you love the song Casey Jones. I don't even know what you're talking about. I, exactly. God bless you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm making light. I'm making light of it. But no, this is a good film. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm assuming that means I'm crazy, and I'm double crazy to use both your pants. Yeah. <laughs> It does. All right, sweet. Okay. Here's the next. All right, thank Ta -da. you. <laughs> so I'm still threading here. Um, or maybe soon. <laughs> no, no, we got it. Hold on. You're throwing, you're throwing me off, lady. And yeah, my rhythm's all off. I have it aside. And. Here. No, no, don't you set me up like that. All right. Here. All right, we here we go. go. <laughs> Yikes! Get get to the youth market, youth demographic, man. You got to make these films important to them. So I guess this is part of part of my life. All right. So here it is: Trouble Ahead, Trouble Behind.
is ever in front of you, you need to follow one of life's time-honored rules. You've been hearing it since you were this big. Don't get too close. Don't get too close. Don't get too close. Don't get too close. I said, don't get too close. How close is too close? It depends on your situation. In a car, well, if the car in front of you stops, how fast can you stop? Or maybe a better way of putting it is, how fast can your car stop? Cars, like everything else in the world, from spitballs to political campaigns, have momentum. Momentum is the tendency a moving object has to keep moving. Two things determine how much momentum something has, how fast it's going, and how heavy it is. This bowling ball is a lot heavier than this soccer ball. That net down there is strong enough to stop either of them. But how soon? The soccer ball isn't very heavy. At that speed, its momentum is not very great. What about this guy? You definitely can't stop a bowling ball on a dime, and motor vehicles are a lot heavier than bowling balls. Let's try a somewhat bigger experiment in momentum. On the track back there is a car with a professional driver in it. He's going to get the car up to 55 miles per hour and listen for a signal through a set of earphones to stop the car. He'll get it at the spot where that flag is standing. Between there and this barrier is a distance of 175 feet. Can he stop before he reaches it? Ready? Go! Stop! It took almost 200 feet for this car to stop. Let's take a look at something else. Even with a skilled professional driver, this is the earliest point at which he could have reacted and gotten his foot on the brake. It takes three quarters of a second to react and get to the brake pedal. At 55 miles per hour, the reaction distance is about 60 feet. The braking distance, based on our old friend's momentum, is between 132 and 164 feet. The total? At 55 miles per hour, a car will go 192 to 222 feet before it stops. Of course, at lower speeds, the stopping distance is shorter. But even at 40 miles per hour, your car will travel 44 feet by the time you hit the brake and another 64 to 80 feet before it stops for a total stopping distance of 108 to 124 feet. If you carried a computer with you in your car and could measure distance by eye, you would always know the answer to how close is too close. Or, if you want to make it easy on yourself, you can just follow the two-second rule. It makes all the adjustments for you. Just watch the vehicle ahead of you go past some definite marker. A telephone pole, a fence corner, a mile marker, or under a bridge or viaduct. Then start counting. 1,001, 1,002. If your car passes the marker before you say two, you're following too closely. I know what you're thinking. That's fine on the highway when there isn't much traffic. But in rush hour, no way. Well. Take a look at the two-second rule in stop-and-go traffic. 1,001, 1,002. Like I said, it's a self-adjusting rule. But suppose you're following the two-second rule and someone cuts in front of you. What then? Decrease your speed by just a mile or two until you establish the two-second distance behind that vehicle. How much time have you lost? About a second. Besides, if that guy was in such a hurry to pass you, he'll probably pass the car that was in front of you. Then you can move back into position. Of course, like most rules, the two-second rule has its exceptions. Most cars take about the same amount of time to stop. 
the two-second rule is designed for cars of about the same size going about the same speed. Trucks are bigger and heavier. They take longer to stop. If a truck is tailgating you, add stopping distance for the truck to your own stopping distance. Follow the four-second rule. Motorcycles are smaller and lighter. They can stop faster than cars. If a motorcycle is in front of you, you're going to need more distance. Follow the four-second rule. With a slow-moving vehicle, you should slow down the moment you see it in front of you. You could be on top of it by the time you count 1,002. There's one more thing that's going to enter into how fast you can stop, and so, how close you can be. It's called friction. Without it, stopping just doesn't happen. With friction, this hockey puck would slow to a stop. Without friction, it slides around like a greased pig. A road that is wet from even a light rain is covered with a thin layer of water and oil. And that's what you're driving on, not the road. It's called hydroplaning. Friction is reduced to a dangerous level. If you're driving in a situation where hydroplaning could occur, slow down and keep a longer following distance. Don't be a hockey puck. a target is in a car yet people do it all the time and the results are not funny besides turning your steering wheel and putting your foot on the brakes when necessary you have another important responsibility while you're on the road letting other drivers know what you intend to do the driver behind you may not even be able to read a map that person certainly can't read your mind your car is equipped with means of communicating with other drivers. Use them. Signal before changing lanes. Signal before turning. When you must slow down quickly and unexpectedly, and sometimes you must, jab your brakes quickly as a warning. Communication is a two-way street. Not only must you give as much information as you can, you must also get as much information as you can. This can almost always be done by looking. Just before changing lanes, turn your head and look. Mirrors can only show you what they reflect. And mirrors can't see everything. Just before pulling out into traffic, turn your head and look. Don't stop unexpectedly. Parking places can be hard to find, but if you're looking for one, drive slowly. When you spot one, use your turn signal to indicate your intentions. Don't stop unexpectedly. Access ramps are not the place for hesitation. Don't stop unexpectedly. Never, under any circumstances, stop in order to back up on an expressway. If the driver behind you had a crystal ball, he couldn't foresee anything that unpredictable. Guard against breakdowns by making sure everything is in good working order, <laughs> regularly. No matter how responsible you are about upkeep on your car, there are times when breakdowns occur. When that happens, leave the roadway immediately. Get your car as far off the traveled portion as you can. 
and get yourself and your passengers even farther away. Put warning devices behind your vehicle. Go for help or wait for assistance if you remain on an expressway. Do not remain like a sitting duck in a disabled vehicle. Don't be an obstacle. You have a responsibility to the drivers behind you. For all you know, they're all on their way to the emergency room. Maintain a reasonable speed so that a following driver is not tempted to risk life and limb in an attempt to pass you. Above all, don't be an obstacle to an emergency vehicle. When you hear that sound or see the flashing lights, move to the right as soon as you can. Slow down immediately. Do not move left no matter what. This is where the emergency vehicle may move. And now we come to those not so charming folk who seem determined to make you a target no matter what you do. The tailgaters. This is what you feel like doing. <clears throat> Stifle the urge. The best way to deal with a tailgater is to persuade him or her to pass you. Slow down gradually. Don't break. Just let up on the accelerator. This encourages the tailgater to take the first opportunity to pass you. You can then resume your speed. Remember, targets belong on archery ranges, not on the road. Wow, 1985 for that one. That's for sure. That is for sure. I mean, the, uh, the shoulder pads, the um, that guy's awesome glasses, uh, sunglasses, the mustache, <laughs> the uh, saddle bread shirt. Yes, very, very 1980s. <coughs> also, we were trying to identify what Chrysler car that was, if that was a LeBaron or what, what, what that was. Anybody, anybody out there up on their 80s, mid-80s cars? Um, but uh, this is definitely of a time. It's, it's interesting. So how I respond to films that came out when I was in school is different than films that came out before I was in school. So... Um, but I definitely learned the two second rule. Well, because I, Vivian, I don't have the camera on. So. I sometimes I just wa watch it, let people watch it, and rewind. So. Sometimes I don't have to have the camera myself. Anyways, um, yeah, so there's driver safety films in this collection as well. So we saw some bike safety, we saw driver safety so far, we saw some uh, civil defense. I think we are going to get up a little bit here. Oh yeah, right here. That's a good one. Maybe I can show it. There we go. I know if I can. Vivian, you're going to have to get out of the way. <laughs> I know you're looking to see if the camera's on, so you can, get, you can catch your uh, 15 seconds. But, uh... All right. Ooh. All right, so this next film, I could go either way. It definitely is a civil defense, but it could be... Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm just going to see how it goes. I'm hoping that this is just not going to be another board meeting. Um, that this will actually be some action or simulated action. We will see. 
Oh, and there was a splice that broke. Hold on a sec. Wow, I didn't even get that threaded. I mean, the splice. Splice break. All right. Hold on. One sec. Uh, the film just broke. Or the film was already broken. Uh, somebody, somebody didn't splice it. Yeah, I'll show it. I just have to advance a little bit. So, looks like it's a good setup, though. Mm. Good setup. All right. Ooh. All right. This one's called Disaster Strikes. Enjoy. With fast falling burden flames. And mile upon mile of lush, abundant farmland. With rocket boundaries guarding our peaceful nation of 145 million Americans. Great cities mark our skyline. Happy, eager people throng our streets. Busy factories reflecting nature's blessings shape a glorious future. are subject to the furies man's work is beauty before the onslaught of mighty forces and by the hot breath of catastrophe today men and science constantly on guard give battle to these destructive forces U.S. Weather Bureau and Coast Guard experts chart storm paths and flash hurricane warnings to help minimize the toll of this menace. Hurricanes yearly threaten havoc to millions living along the Gulf and Atlantic coast. Organized to combat calamity are thousands of volunteers serving with the American Red Cross. Nerve Center for five area offices of the Disaster Preparedness and Relief Service is at National Headquarters, Washington, D.C. Here, a vast communications network is in immediate contact with the scene of every major catastrophe occurring throughout the United States. When a major disaster threatens, facilities and resources of military, naval, coast guard, and civil authorities join forces with the Red Cross to expedite relief operations in stricken areas. Through its area offices, Red Cross reaches its 3,754 chapters and 5,578 branches, covering every county in the United States. In a stricken region, key people from municipal, health, and safety forces are in session a disaster preparedness committee, which months before organized a program to cope with such emergencies as they now face. With the community threatened, the disaster program swings into action. Areas have been surveyed, temporary shelters, feeding and medical stations designated. Nothing has been overlooked in the preparedness plan. human life. Thousands must be moved speedily from danger zones to shelter. Difficulties of transportation and blocked highways must be overcome. Emergency crews comb the countryside to expedite safety measures. Old-time residents reluctant to leave their homes must be assisted. 
Every effort is made to save movable household goods. Livestock, so essential to farm life, must be rescued and rooted to places of security. By the time the predicted disaster strikes, the Preparedness Committee and cooperating agencies have worked hard in saving off heavier death and property toll. Despite nature's rampage, the emergency needs of the disrupted populace are met. Without warning, the terrifying twister, tornado, swoops with cataclysmic fury upon helpless communities. In its wake, utter desolation and death. Tornadoes strike somewhere in this country on an average of 146 times a year. Another unpredictable disaster, earthquake. In recent years, 45 states have experienced its prevalence. Earthquakes smash gas and water mains. Fires quickly follow, spread unchecked, causing tremendous life and property loss. Fire, the great destroyer, constantly ravages our land. Property loss alone in one year reached a half billion dollars. Fires, most of them caused by man's negligence, continue to destroy, to maim, and to kill. Forest fires denude the land, causing soil erosion, and then floods. Preventive measures can only lessen, not eliminate, man's carelessness. In a single year, over 200,000 forest fires destroyed enough timber to build a quarter of a million badly needed homes. There is always work for disaster proof. Tragedy at sea occurs infrequently. Nevertheless, chapter workers are ready when survivors are brought ashore, providing blankets, clothing, hot food, nursing, ambulance. Home service quickly communicates with worried families of passengers and crew. Accidents are more frequent, some of them serious. Within minutes after this crash, chapter units were assisting police and hospital workers in rescue and first aid. Air travel, ever on the increase, is not without its unfortunate incident. and quarry accidents. Each stark tragedy leaves its scars on families for years to come. Thousands of people. Floods have happened in every month 
and in every state. In one great flood alone, the American people rushed $25 million to the Red Cross to help one million homeless. Repeated experiences with disaster have given Red Cross workers the know-how of meeting these situations without confusion or panic. on the stricken area. Overcoming such handicaps as disrupted transportation, communication, and other facilities, the disaster preparedness and relief committees and cooperating government and local agencies hold to a minimum loss of life and property. In providing food, shelter, and medical and nursing care to guard health, they have helped to check epidemic. The prepared shelters prove a godsend to the homeless. To avert hysteria, vital information is rushed in answer to the thousands of calls and telegrams from anxious relatives who fear for their loved ones. Disaster workers immediately record all deaths hospitalizations, family placements, and shelter occupants so that separated families can be reunited. To people who have lost all their belongings, extra clothing is an urgent need. Here, the purpose of the Chapter Production Corps is achieved. This is only the beginning of disaster relief. Problems face the aged, the homeless, the injured. Many families require aid. Help is ready for those in need. Their wants will be reviewed by experienced caseworkers who will visit their homes and their injured kin in hospital. Committee of Representative Community Leaders, here's case workers present full facts on each register, the family disaster loss, its resources, and the extent to which it can assume part of its rehabilitation. Beyond that, the Red Cross provides finances to meet the need. Case number 205, a 31-year-old breadwinner with wife and son. Disaster injury caused amputation of his leg. Previous family illness depleted their savings. They faced large hospital bill and added expense of artificial limb. Family requires maintenance until man can work again. Caseworker recommends meeting these needs. Cost, $1,640. The committee agrees. The award is just. Case number 416, a veteran's home has been heavily damaged by fire. He has a wife and baby. The wife's health is very poor. They are heavily in debt. Needed, beyond insurance, to repair home, $1,460. Approved. Case number 91, 
elderly couple in failing health and without funds. Their supporting son has been hospitalized. The case will be held active for later review. Immediate maintenance to the extent of $300 is needed. Disaster sufferers are a cross-section of America, helped to their feet again by generosity and neighborliness expressed through the Red Cross in outright gifts handled confidentially, so preserving the dignity of these citizens in their community. There are many problems to be solved after each disaster. A small herd of cattle is given to a farmer whose livelihood was swept away. Replacement of a carpenter's tools enables him to resume his work. Long-term medical nursing care is provided for severely injured. A blind woman's radio, her main contact with the outside world, is restored. Nursing aid in many cases continues for months after disaster strikes. of disaster grows on. This year, every year, thousands will be maimed or killed. Some of them may be your neighbors. Millions in property will be lost. Thousands of homes destroyed. Today, 3,000 counties and there are many agencies working through Red Cross are prepared to meet emergencies to feed, house, and help millions of people. But today, unfortunately, there are some communities not fully organized to cope with a major calamity. Public awareness will hasten action to remove this risk. We know we should be, must be ready when disaster strikes. Well, that was awesome. <laughs> that was really quite something. Um, yeah, so I did a little bit of research to see uh, to see what um, if I could get a year, and I couldn't find anything. And this this one is missing the title. Um, I did find Harvard has it, and the Chicago Film Archive has it, has it, but neither one of them list a year. Um, have this this is what broke off the end and this one doesn't have a title maybe it does I don't know somebody look it up Let's see I can see it there a little bit so I'll, I'll get I'll bring out a loop and I'll see if I can get a, a if there's a year on it but um, wow yeah that was really noisy um, audio and I at the last minute found um, in this program I'm using called uh, uh, open open source broadcaster studio or open broadcaster studio um, they have a plugin that does a little bit of noise suppression so I'm going to tweak that a little bit and see if I can bring up the levels and take out the hiss um, let's see um, you know, it's always like a work in progress, always trying to tweak things, try to figure things out. So I appreciate you guys uh, bearing with that. But man, that was awesome. All those explosions and those plane crashes and all that tragedy wasn't alluded to. It was actually shown on the screen. That's what, that's what we were hoping for. So we're rewinding here. Um, yeah, so for those of you who are just joining, what time is it? It's 9, 10. Um, yeah, so tonight we're watching films uh, from the Texas Department of Public Safety. Uh, Texas uh, archives the moving image 
uh, got a bunch of these films, and uh, they pulled out only the films that were Texas-related, and everything else they passed on because they have limited space there. Uh, and that's what's happening more and more often is archives are beginning to look at their shelves, and they're saying, like, you know what, this is not really what we're looking for, so let's find somebody else who will take these on. And so I've gotten stuff from lots of different places, uh, Alaska, um, Tennessee. Um, I've even gotten some vinegar stuff, stuff that was really beginning to deteriorate um, that we scanned on one of my scanners, um, which was great. Uh, some of it we could get, some of it we can't. Uh, I might show you some of that at some point. Uh, and maybe we'll do a show where we actually are feeding off the scanner so you can kind of see what that looks like. Because it's kind of cool. Kind of. Um, anyways, let me wind this up. Uh, so anyways, uh, Texas Department of Public Safety has driver's ed stuff, has bike safety, has general disaster stuff. Um, some civil defense, as I said. Uh, this one is it says for police only. So, see. police only. So, we will see what this is. This one is a little. Oh, whoo! Oh, God, it stinks. Yeah, so, oh, detecting recording skid marks. Let's see how this is. I, I think I have another copy of this. Yeah, this is messed up. I'm not going to show this one. Whew. Vinegar smell. Uh, that's basically the acetate breaking down and making that very difficult, if not impossible, to show. Um, I have another copy of that film somewhere else that I'll show you at some point. It will be great. Um, all right, let's do some more civil defense. The office of civil defense they have this really great logo oh man this one is also vinegar you can see can you see the faceting let's see if this comes off what it looks like oh this breaks my heart because i think this is color so this would be something that we would try to scan on the one of our other machines let's see you know what, I'm gonna try this. You're, are you willing to give it a shot? Let's try this, see what happens. It's really strong, so it, yeah, we'll see what happens here. No guarantees, all right? We'll give this a shot, it might be, it might not work, it might just roll. So we'll see, see how that goes. individual and family reaction actions on warning so this is you hear the air raid siren what do you do next so we'll see how this goes all right we'll give it a shot we'll see what happens uh, I'm gonna go ahead and type this on individual and family response after one. Um, let me give a shout out to everybody that, uh, I, I don't know if you can see, God, I always get, never get this right, uh, donated Patreon. Patreon is a great way to contribute to the AV Geeks. Um, and it's almost like a, a subscription tip jar. You can pay a little bit every month and it adds up. It's really been great uh, there's been a lot of really great support and thank you some of you guys have been tuning in what we have been able to do is buy equipment we've been able to buy films you know leader stuff like that you know it's all towards kind of making this better and better and better and and more interesting and you know so that we can do these more often um so patreon is awesome all right we're gonna give this a shot um it might just roll a bunch which means i have to put my finger right here to keep it from rolling. We'll see. Are you are you willing to give this a shot? Here we go. 
Enjoy. Kenny, let's have some news it's about that time. Come on, Dad. You can watch that show some other time. Okay. Thanks. But due to the sudden resolution of the problem and the relaxing of tension, the Secretary General moved for an adjournment, and this was approved by the Council. The issue will be debated by the General Assembly. And now for the local news. With all eyes on the tense international situation last week, we interviewed this morning the local official who is perhaps the man most directly concerned. The director for civil defense for the city, Mr. Stanley J. Packard. And here is that filmed report. Mr. Packard, did the international crisis affect your civil defense activities in any way? Yes, many of our emergency civil defense activities were stepped up. Does our continental defense system affect civil defense? Of course. We learned some valuable lessons from last week's crisis, and we're incorporating them in our community planning. Yes, sir, but was our local civil defense ready for any contingency? Not as ready as we could be. How about the general public? A little hard to say. Were you ready? Well, sir, I did remember that there was a shelter in the basement of my studio building, if that's what you mean. That's exactly what I mean. The fact that you know where a shelter is and how to get to it puts you way ahead of a great many people. I'm afraid many do not. Do you think the recent crisis has made people think about it? I certainly hope so. As a matter of fact, this would be a very good time for everyone to make sure he knows the alert and take cover warning signals, where the public shelters are located and how to get to them, and most especially, to review his own family preparedness plan. In other words, just what each member of his family is supposed to do in case of attack. Thank you, Mr. Packard. That was Stanley J. Packard, director of our local Office of Civil Defense. And by the way, do you know exactly what your family would do if an attack came? Say at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Good question, isn't it? It's a darn good question. Mm -hmm. It is. Mommy. Okay. I know what you'd do. You'd rush over to the grammar school to be with Janet. How about you? You'd probably jump into the car and dash like a madman for home. Uh, Janice, she'd probably run for home as fast as her legs could carry her. Oh, no, I wouldn't. I'd go down in the basement in school like the teacher said. Look, don't give me that, Stella. Don't give me that. All right. Do right. we really know what to do if the warning comes? Of course, we'd all go down to the grammar school. It's the nearest shelter. Oh, great. You'd all come over with me. That's fine if the warning came right now when we're all here. Suppose you were at the church at choir practice, or if you were at the shopping center, or with your bridge club. Say we were up at the lake. Oh, gee, Mommy, what if Kenny was out in the south high? Fred, what's the point of all this? Now you're right, honey. We need some answers. 
Do the kids know what to do if there is no warning, just a flash? Of course they do. Janice, what did your teacher tell you? Well, she told us to get under our desk and stay away from windows, and then we all go down the basement and stay there. Who knows? Well, that's okay, as far as it goes. But the bombs can fall so far away from here that we won't see any flash or feel any concussion or hear any sound except the warning siren. The danger will come a little later. Radioactive fallout. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's the stuff that gives off the rays that can go right through you. And you don't even know about it until you get sick. You can die. Oh, okay. Now, Costa, Costa. Well, it's true. You're just trying no. to scare Janice. Mom, can I take my milk and apple now? Look. All right, all right. Look, let's do this. Let's go over what each of us would do, taking different days and different circumstances. All right. But let's start first with the Mr. Harum Scarum. Who, me? Mm -hmm. I know what to do. Oh, all right then. Tell us. Start with 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and uh, give us a few other examples. Okay. It's 10 o'clock tomorrow. Well, that's easy. I'd be in school. And I'd be just about finishing second period history. Now, if the warning came, we'd all go into the shelter in the basement. We've done it lots of times before. It only takes a few minutes. Oh, well, that's easy. Janice even knows that. Yes, that's right. But let's just say this happened when you were on your way to school. What would you do then? All right. Let's say I heard the warning going to school or coming home after school. If the warning came then, I'd head for whichever was closest. But if nobody was home, I'd probably go to the school. In any case, I'd head for one or the other, and fast. Now, if I was somewhere else, farther from here, say over on Central Avenue with Bud, well, then I guess I'd look for shelter over there. I think I remember seeing a sign outside of Mitchell's department store. You know, we had that practice drill last year sure we'd want to come home if we could, but there might not be enough time. Another place I might be is over at the Diamond in Shelley Park. If the warning came then, I'd be closer to home than anywhere else. So I'd hop on my bike. I could make it home in 10 minutes. Well, that's what I'd do. Okay? Okay, Kenny. I don't know. Fred, I think we should all be together in a situation like that. Well, listen, Edith, we'd be much better off to survive and get together afterwards. Besides, the marked shelters would give more protection than our basement. I think that's right. Janet, what if you were playing with Betty? Would you know what to do? Sure I would. What, honey? Go into Betty's house. Yes. Yeah. And do what Betty's mother tells me. You no, know, I'd come and get you just as soon as I could, don't you? Sure, I know you would. And then we'd all go to my school basement. If it was time. Don't worry about me, Daddy. <laughs> all right. Now, your turn. Well, let's see. Tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. Tomorrow's Wednesday. First, I drive you to work. Then I come home. And then I go to the supermarket. It would just be about 10 o'clock when I get there. I don't know if there's a shelter in the store. I doubt it. Besides, it's less than a mile from home, so... Even if I couldn't use the main roads and I had to take the side streets all the way, I think I could make it home in less than ten minutes. And then I could go to the grammar school and be with Janet. Or if it were afternoon and I took the bus downtown to the shopping district and the warning came, oh, the sensible thing would be to go into the shelter right there. 
If I knew the kids were safe in school, I think I could do it. There are a lot of other places I might be. Myrna Freeman, Dorothy. Or if it were Bridge Club Day, I could be at Moose House. One of them always drives me to where we're playing. So if the warning came, I couldn't very well ask one of them to take me home. They'd have their own families to worry about. What would you do? Well, I could walk to Kenny's high school. Hey, I could come and put you on my bike. We're on the handlebars. Well, I could. I'm sure I could. You just stay in school. And you know where you are. Okay, your turn now, Fred. Well, uh... Number one, if I were at the plant, well, they've got a perfectly good shelter right in the building. If I had the car with me, though, I'd want to go home. No, I think you should stay at the plant. That'd be hard to do. I want to be sure that you and the kids were safe. Well, that's what we're doing now, isn't it? Making sure. That's right. You know, there's a fellow on my bowling team, Joe. I drove him home after the game Saturday. He took me inside to show me something he built in his basement. It was a concrete block shelter. Built it in a corner to take advantage of the basement wall. Built it in his spare time. Stocked it pretty well, too. Holding cots and chairs, flashlights, spare batteries, portable radio, all kinds of canned food, containers filled with water, Tools, first aid kit, the works. Even books for the kids. He lets them use it as a playroom as long as they keep their hands off the supplies. Made me wish we'd done something like that in our basement. Well, I feel pretty safe. After all, the grammar school is only a few blocks away. Yeah. If we could get there. Well, why couldn't we? There might not be enough time. Traffic might delay us. Ah. Now look, on a nice day when you've got plenty of time, it's a short walk to the grammar school. Look at the sirens blowing, everyone on the move. Every block could seem a mile long. Oh, we'd make it easy. Oh? What if we were delayed trying to cross Century Boulevard? Why? Because it's also Highway 61, that's why. The main eastbound road. Yeah, I forgot about that. I never thought about that either. If for some reason we couldn't leave the house. Yeah. Then what do we do? Well, uh, we could improve the protection, right? How? Well, I've got all those gunny sacks in the garage. They could become sandbags. Kenny and I could half fill them with dirt from around your rose bushes. Well, why half full? Try carrying a full bag of dirt sometime. Then we could use them to block the window well. Yeah, but it sounds as if there wouldn't be enough time. I really ought to build a shelter like Joe McClellan. I could get one of those civil defense manuals and see the best way. The best way is to go to school. Probably right. You remember Myrna Freeman? Mm -hmm. Well, she's taking one of those courses on medical self-help. What's that? Well, first aid is what you do until the doctor comes. And medical self-help is what you do in case the doctor never comes. Well, we talked about every situation. Yeah, but next month we're going on vacation. What do we do then? That's right. We'll be in a strange town with open country. We use common sense. If we stay overnight in a hotel, we always notice where the fire exit is on our floor, don't we? Well, we should do the same with shelter signs. In the downtown area of any city, there'll be shelters in most of the large buildings. To you keep your eyes open for them, you can't miss them. And if we're out in the open country, some farms have shelter possibilities, like a root cellar or some sort of underground storage room.
something like an up-to-date dairy farm might have shelter potential too, where the buildings are made of concrete or cement blocks. And if we couldn't get to town, the things we normally carry in our car would help. Flashlight, tools, first aid kit, Kenny's transistor radio. And on weekend trips, we usually have some kind of food and a thermos of milk. Dad, what if we were at Uncle Arnold's farm? Well, Kenny, let's see. That apple storage of his has the makings of a good fallout shelter. If we had any warning at all, we could fix it up in plenty of time. If an attack comes, the important thing is that we have a plan. Wherever we are, together or alone. Still, things are going to be pretty bad. Oh, but not the end of the world. People are going to survive. And I think our chances now are darn good. You know, Fred, I'm really awfully glad you made us have this talk. Me too. Dad, you're on the ball. Oh, that's okay, Kenny. I feel much better now. I, I really do. So do I. Now, each of us knows what to do. Just in case. You know, Mom, maybe Janice would use her head to stay in school. I don't know what everybody's worrying about. My teacher knows what to do, and so does Mama, and Daddy, and even Kenny. My goodness, grown-ups sure do worry. <laughs> Wow, things got kind of nuts there at the end. Um, I don't know if you notice the... Uh, I'll rewind it a little bit. You can kind of see... Just the... Uh, all the color and the cracking of the emulsion and the going way out of focus because the curl is pretty significant. But um, so I basically um, had to put my finger on <laughs> all the film to the um, little sensor here. There's a little sprocketed wheel here that monitors where frame is and when it's warped then it doesn't always match and you have to mesh it down using the uh, Telecine's old friend, your finger. Um, you'd be surprised what uh, sophisticated equipment is augmented with uh, a finger. It's, it's quite a bit. But um, the other thing, I so I was sitting there basically doing this and got kind of bored. So I was basically trying to color correct uh, on the fly, which you don't normally do that, but so I'm going to turn off all the color correction that I did. Um, turn that off. That's, that's okay. Then I'm going to turn this off. And this off. So it was a lot more purplish red than uh, what you saw. Now I'm short. Sit on a different chair. Um, so. Yeah, that was uh, that was fascinating. You know, again, very subdued and very uh, um, yes, let's be very thoughtful about this. And this is what's going to happen. And let's talk through this plan. I mean, really, you know, atomic stuff is is scary. But really, if you think about it, they're being very thoughtful. Like, what is the plan? Okay, if there's a natural disaster, like, is there a tornado? What is the plan? What do you do? And I don't think we're having that discussion nowadays. Um, I seem to remember there was something, Homeland Security at one point said something about duct tape, which was just ludicrous. Um, you know, and, you know, they talk about creating a disaster kit and all that stuff. It's great. But is it talked about in schools? Is it shown on television beyond, like, a PSA that's played at, you know, or in the wee hours of the night or in the morning? Um, no. So, I, you know, I think it's just good civil defense is really just being prepared for stuff like that. Um, so, you know, sure, ducking under a desk is not going to save you from an atomic blast, but it might save you if you're not close enough to atomic blast and there's debris falling from the ceiling. Um, that might be something that's useful. So, 
There you go. There's my PSA. All right. Let's see what we got here. I'm excited about this. Um, I'm not gonna say what it is. I'm gonna thread it up, but um, again, love police training films, um, and this is a police training film. About how to deal with a certain situation. Let me, there we go. Oh, so that curl is mostly gone. So it's fascinating. If I, you saw how I just I rewound it, and now the curl is not as severe as it was. So this is something that we might be able to scan before it completely deteriorates. This is the plan. All right. So I'll put this in the scan me pile. Scan me as soon as possible. Alright, uh, so this next film, Motor Motorola uh, Teleprogram um, Incorporated became MTI and it eventually um, merged with uh, Cornet and some other folks. And so Motorola, of course, the radio people who made the uh, police radios, they came up with this, these training films, so there's a lot of MTI films. Uh, that I have that deal with a wide variety of different um, police and uh, emergency worker stuff. Um, some of it is phenomenal. Uh, some of it I can't, I don't really feel like I can show nowadays because it is so um, inflammatory. It's so, it's like, God, why aren't police officers watching this stuff? It's really, you know, it seems like they got it right back in the 70s and now they're not showing it again or they're showing something else. So it's a debate that I don't know if I feel adequate discussing. Anyways, so this next film, um, probably shouldn't be showing this online. Who knows? I know this series really well. Other ones in this series, it, just like with drug films, you know, they not only show, you know, the dangers of something, but they also show you how to do it. And so this film might actually do that. So, um... I don't think I'm actually going to give the title on it. I, I'm a little sheepish about this one, but um, we'll watch it and we'll figure it out. All right. Enjoy.
Hello. Uh, this is an emergency. Bombs. Am I being recorded at this very moment? I am. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. My name is Jones. Now get this. Room 627 is immediately beneath the main surgery facility, the Parkway Hospital. At this moment, a man named... Garcia is undergoing open heart surgery. And from what I understand, this uh, procedure is going to take about uh, three hours, give or take a few minutes either way. Is that that? Now look at the bomb I placed is near the ceiling of room six two seven. Yes, that's correct. Now wait, hold it! Don't run! Don't run! I'd like to describe the bomb for you. The explosive is a charge of 20 pounds of 75% DuPont extra. Extra. That's right. A clock arming delay is just now activated. A clock firing delay. There are two pressure release micro switches on the bottom. Uh, a tremor switch, a thermal biometallic switch. Now the hit him. Yeah, it sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Now look, uh... As I add it all up here, you've got roughly about two hours and ten minutes uh, to deactivate it or to pay me a hundred thousand dollars in cash to tell you how to uh, turn it off. Get the picture? You got a hundred thousand dollars? Give me a raise. Now look, I'll call you back at the hospital after you've examined the bomb. And listen, friend. This is the real thing. Let's go see what we got. The bomber you have just heard may be a madman, a fool, a professional saboteur, a fraudulent exploiter, an extortion expert, or a mild-mannered electronics engineer gone off his rocker. As much as that may matter later, what matters now is the harm he can do, purposely or accidentally and the lives he can take in an unholy pursuit of the awful explosion. An explosion is a sudden going of one place to someplace else. There are three kinds of explosions. This mechanical explosion was caused by moisture in concrete. The most common explosion is of a chemical nature, caused by the initiation of a compound or mixture which undergoes a rapid chemical change, resulting in a large amount of gaseous pressure, heat, and a loud report. This is a five-room house and the effect of 50 pounds of dynamite. The third classification of explosions is atomic. Explosives are unstable chemical compounds found in solid, liquid, or gaseous forms, which when properly initiated, decompose or explode. The speed with which an explosive compound decomposes determines its type. 
These are called low explosives because they do not normally explode violently unless properly confined. They are burning explosives such as black powder. Smokeless powder. Potassium chlorate mixed with sugar and sulfuric acid. Metallic sodium, which detonates when mixed with water. Ballastite. Confined and unconfined firecrackers. These are high explosives. Military TNT, dynamite, C3 and C4 plastic explosives, primacord, and nitrocarbonitrate. They are relatively insensitive to heat, shock, or friction, and are used ordinarily as main bursting charges. Fertilizer and kerosene will work in that category. Detonate a cord with the power of a high explosive along its entire length. Dynamite. A boosted charge of TNT and PETN. Nitrocarbonitrate. Kinetic explosives like Astropack and liquid high explosives. Military TNT. C3, C4, Flex X. To appreciate Mr. Jones's bomb and its true capabilities, a bomb specialist seeks to understand the type of explosive used by the bomber. In his extortion demand, Jones described the bomb as containing 20 pounds of 75% DuPont extra. The percentage figure indicates the nitroglycerin content of the dynamite, generally from 20 to 75 percent. This duplicate case contains the type and the amount of dynamite indicated by Jones. If the manufacturer of Jones' car isn't lying, and the car is in working order, the turning of this key will set in motion a series of mechanical and chemical reactions which will propel the car down the street and away from the scene before he can be detected. This is ignition. He may be miles away, even hours away, when conveniently his homemade invention will rip out the walls of a building for which he has no use. Ignition is one means of initiating a bomb. The same kind of ignition that started this car, an electrical charge reaching explosive vapors. Simple. The firecracker was initiated by flame, as you light a fuse on a bomb. In all bombs, there must be an initiating action which will start a chain of events leading to the explosion. Jones knows how the bomb works. Bomb specialists will have to find out the hard way. This is a basic propellant firing train. The ignition of the flash compound will in turn explode the propelling charge. In this case, the flash compound inside the detonator is ignited and in turn provides the heat and pressure to explode the booster, which in turn sets off the main charge. 
Here, the battery-charged clock hand will touch a contact closing a circuit, causing current to flow to a detonator. And it's a time bomb. To deactivate a bomb, any bomb, you must interrupt the firing train. At some point, someone has to turn it off. Somehow. Or it blows. Simple. And as Mr. Jones suggested, it can get more complicated. Bombing, like the sending off of rockets on the 4th of July or the launch of a spacecraft, is an anticipatory event. Only the date and place need be announced to draw a crowd, to gain attention, to extort, to coerce, to kill. It is a heinous crime, perpetrated successfully by scheming and often intelligent persons, professional terrorists, men to whom the act of creating fear is joy to whom these moments provide a strange and compelling sense of power. Only the imagination of the perpetrator can limit the certainty and extent of the crime. The saving of human life is the bomb specialist's essential goal. It is also the goal of any officer on the scene. Dismantling or deactivation of a bomb should never be attempted when there is jeopardy to persons other than those duty bound to perform. In dealing with managers and businessmen, even with a hospital administrator, it may be difficult to impress them with the true potentialities of a bomb. Business may be effected by evacuation. The panic of a disorganized evacuation may cause more harm than good. Tact is the officer's best offense. Arguments of liability, warrants, emergency powers are all to be measured against time, the time of a bomb. Jones was right. A man named Garcia has his chest wide open in the room above 627. He can't be moved for two and a half hours. You never know. It could be a hoax. But there's an unofficial feeling. If a caller simply says there's a bomb and hangs up, it's usually a fake. The more precise the call, the more likely it's real. Mr. Jones' only lie was probably his name. Bomb specialist or rookie policeman, one phrase can someday ring true in your ear. Duty bound. You might have a terrible bomb 30 feet from people who cannot be moved. Or you might have five empty tuna fish cans wrapped in chicken wire. That simple difference is the name of the game. There are very few buildings which cannot be evacuated. Very few rooms, and no room, no building, is worth a human life, if the life can be moved. Uh, you got about an hour and a half, a little less than you. What do you think? We're going to fluoroscope it. We requested your money, is that all right? Well, we have some questions about the bomb we want to ask you. No equipment you have will help. But don't let me discourage you. I'll call you back. Many small departments are stuck with the essential tools you see here. A 100-foot length of quarter-inch rope, a non-sparking knife, and wire cutters of the same material, 
These are the most important tools of the bomb disposal technician. But other equipment is recommended and is in use. This bomb carrier has been successfully tested with 20 pounds of 40% nitroglycerin dynamite. The design of the carrier directs the force of the explosion upward from the sand line bottom of the three quarter inch thick boiler like container. The purpose of the truck is to transport a bomb safely from the scene to a place where it may be dismantled, stored, deactivated or blown without injury to persons or property. There are other types of bomb carriers available, each with its own characteristics. There is only one rule about bomb carriers. If you have one available, take it with you on every call. Never leave it behind. You never know what you have until you get there. This truck contains everything from a box of tongue depressors to an armored suit and an x-ray machine. Like an ambulance or a fire truck, the bomb carrier is a professional vehicle, equipped and maintained to deal with the widest range of emergency situations. As expensive as it may be, it can't think. Duty bound may mean a suit of armor and sophisticated equipment, or it may mean a hunk of clothesline a pocket knife and some wire cutters in the hands of a dedicated and properly frightened policeman. Either way, duty bound is no place for ignorant heroism. Professional bomb specialists work alone, special assistants, patrolmen, detectives, and all other personnel assigned remain at safe distance unless absolutely required. The reason for this is simple. If the bomb goes, this man will need immediate first aid. Any officer who handles a bomb should have someone standing by to pick up the pieces. An open bomb is one where some of the parts are visible to the naked eye. A closed bomb one like this one, is the worst. The portable fluoroscope, or x-ray machine, is an expensive item that takes some of the mystery out. But there are some bombs constructed to be radiation sensitive. And if you fluoroscope them, they go up. Mr. Jones wasn't that nasty. The explosive is a charge of 20 pounds of 75% deep x clock arming delay has just now activated a clock firing delay. There are two pressure release micro switches, a tremor switch, a thermal bimetallic switch for 32 degrees, and a collapsible relay wired in parallel. But he was nasty enough. Yes, sir. Room 627. Yes, sir. Parkway General Hospital. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Could you hold on just a moment, please? Ship Commander, this dispatch. We have a bomb threat at Parkway General Hospital from 627. It sounds authentic. Yes, sir. Parkway General. Every effective American police department should have a tactical plan, which at this moment goes into effect. Bomb squad, this dispatch. If it hasn't a plan, at this point it's probably too late to get one. In the absence of a plan, the work of bomb disposal will more often than not fall to the inexperienced hands of a bold but foolish patrolman. The responsibility of coordinating police, fire, military and civilian energies at the instant a bomb threat is received is the first second in a race against time. There are known bomb specialists available for telephone consultation. There are Army Explosive Ordnance personnel also available to the department or officer suddenly stuck with it. 
there is help if there is time. The first police officer on the scene of a located bomb should order the immediate evacuation of all persons to a place at least 300 feet from the bomb. Bystanders should be kept away from windows, even in a seemingly safe area. Unless duty bound, unless there are no other trained personnel available, unless the fuse is lit and you're it, no police officer should touch a suspected bomb or explosive. Move the people away from the bomb. Never move the bomb away from the people. These are the rules for handling suspected packages. Don't submerge in water. Don't attempt to open a package by hand. Don't cut a string or unlatch a box or suitcase by hand. Don't turn a box or cylinder by hand. Don't puncture or cut into a box. Don't accept identification markings on a package or box. Don't pass metallic tools over a package. Don't work more than one man near the bomb. Don't cut any wires. Don't open pipe caps by hand. Don't be a hero. Except for one little hitch, the uniformed officer has done everything he should do. Evacuate, call for the assistance of a specialist, aid in the coordination of fire, police, and civilian efforts, leave the bomb alone. That is the correct procedure here. Except for one little hitch. Now what do you think? Now, what do you think? <laughs> wow, that was really, really something. Man, that was so great. I'm, I'm so happy that I was able to show that film. Oh, let me uh, kill this. So, yes, that was that was Mickey Rooney. I'd like to think he was paying. Uh, mortgage payment or something um <laughs> when i first saw that film i was like wow that's really really crazy um and i mean the thing is that film is supposed to tell you how to deal with uh bombs but it kind of tells you how to make a bomb so please don't do that please don't get me in trouble and by making an explosive please i got i got enough problems with uh, vinegar films and 25,000 films and etc. So the next show that we're going to do is going to be on uh, August 12th. And it's going to be about travel. So all types of films about travel. Um, so uh, I've got lots of interesting things related to that. Um, about different types of transportation, about different ways to travel about trips, etc. Um, so that's, like I said, August 12th. Again, thank you guys for tuning in, and um, I hope you enjoyed what you saw. Uh, just as an introduction, I'm Skip Alzheimer of AV Geeks. I collect old films and show them to folks like you, and very much enjoy doing it. So I enjoy your comments, and I enjoy when you share this. Uh, these should be saved so that you can uh, forward them to friends, etc., um, and if you like what you saw, you'd like to help the AV Geeks, there's a couple of ways to do it. One way is to go to Patreon and make a donation. Uh, another way is to go to avgeeks.com and buy DVDs. Uh, another way is to watch uh, AV Geeks content on YouTube. Uh, some of them have ad revenue, and that is a way for us to actually um, kind of pay some bills and uh, do some other things like uh, buy more stuff. There's some stuff on eBay recently that I don't think anybody's bidding on that 
is just it seems so strange I have to to bid on it so um, maybe we'll get it maybe we'll watch it in a future thing um, but thanks again everybody for coming out and uh, I look forward to seeing you again uh, oh yeah if you're in the Raleigh area what's coming up next show that I'm doing uh, locally is I'm actually going to be introducing uh, Starship Troopers at the Alamo Draft House tomorrow um, at 7.30 I believe I think that show is actually sold out but uh, I get to introduce that film which is one of my favorites um, for lots of reasons uh, so there's that and then on Tuesday at the King's which is a bar and club in downtown Raleigh at 8 o'clock I will be showing the scariest film in the AV Geeks collection. This is a film that I saw when I was 12 and it freaked me out so bad that I ran out of the theater in tears and had nightmares for a month. I had to sleep uh, in the same room as my parents because I was completely freaked out. Um, so what is that film? Come on Tuesday and find out. It is uh, I just pulled, I actually bought it on film recently and I just saw parts of it today and it started giving me, um, the hairs on the back of my head started sticking up. So there's still some sort of uh, damage, psychic damage that that film caused me. So uh, witness it live and we can talk about it. I'll have a, an encounter session where I confront my deepest fears and I can tell you a little bit more about the filmmaker who I met who, uh, who made this film and about the other films he made. Um, so anyways, that's 8 o'clock. Kings show up at 7.30, doors open. Um, five buck donation. Then uh, at the Alamo Draft House on the following Monday, not tomorrow, but the following Monday, I'll be doing a show called Kids Don't Try This at Home. And these are safety films for kids about being in the home, plus some other kind of weird films. Uh, safety Woman takes uh, appears, Guardiana, Safety Woman. Um, so if you're in the area, please go there and support AV Geeks at the Alamo. I'm very happy. It's a wonderful space. And I just got a brand new Xenon projector, so I get to try that out there. So uh, that's another thing that you're helping contribute to is improving our projection and trying to boost the, the quality. Um, the narration quality is not going to change. It's going to be as ad hoc and as ad libbed. Um, as always, <laughs> but uh, we'll try to make the technology better. We'll make the lighting better. We'll make the everything would be better, but I'll still be winging it every single time. So thanks, guys, again. Uh, see you again, hopefully either in person or uh, on via the Internet. So take care.